All right. Hello, thank you everyone for coming to our breakout session here on personalization. Welcome, I am Bob Meixner. I head up the Solutions Consulting Group at Magento Commerce in North America. We have assembled a brilliant set of panelists here for you guys this afternoon to talk about everybody's favorite subject, personalization. So what we're going to do is kind of go around. I have a few questions prepared to get uh, the panelists' opinions on essentially how merchants can start get started with personalization, evolve their strategies, iterate, and so on. So we'll walk through those. Before we do that, let's go ahead and uh, introduce the panelists. I'm joined here by, uh, we have Karthik Shadambaram, we have Mark Brins, and we have Osric Powell with us, and I'll let them introduce themselves here. Karthik? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Bob. Uh, my name is uh, Karthik Chidambaram, a founder and CEO of uh, DC Cap. Started the company in uh, 2005, been about 11 years now. Uh, early adopter of uh, Magento, working in the platform since uh, 2008. Started off uh, doing a lot of implementations and support, working with a variety of different uh, customers and merchants. And along the way, definitely learned a great deal uh, working with uh, customers, from the customers, and also advised them on uh, personalization and marketing. Excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Bins, and I work for Acid Green. Um, Acid Green are Magento Enterprise partners and also Google Premier partners. And my position at the agency is once we've built a website for someone, is to help them to make their websites more profitable. So I've been working with Magento since 2011, um, both client and agency side in the UK and now in Australia. Hi everyone, I'm Osric Powell from Barilliance. I'm the sales director. Barilliance uh, are a personalization software vendor. Uh, we have customers like Surf Stitch and uh, Autodesk, LG Electronics. We have Magento customers like Princess Polly, uh, Lay by Land, Sleep Solutions, Pushies, and a number of others uh, using us for personalization. Excellent. All right, so to, to kick things off, the first question is, I guess, really to each of you. There was an interesting survey that Adobe did recently. They surveyed all marketers and asked them, of all the capabilities that are out there, what is the most important in terms of online marketing and e-commerce? And a third of the respondents came back with personalization. So given the importance and the significance of personalization, what would you say is the, the key to defining and executing on a personalization strategy. So Karthik, we'll, we'll start with you. No, definitely, uh, thank you. See, I think the key is uh, first to take a honest look at where exactly you stand in terms of the personalization journey. Uh, do you already have a personalization strategy in place or are you just getting started? And then understand what problem you're looking to solve and what the requirements are. Have a three or a six month plan and also be able to measure what's going to happen in three months and how is it progressing in six months. You asked about the key elements mm -hmm. or the key constituent for any successful uh, personalization strategy definitely is data, right? So have, take a look at your data, right? Do you already have the data constituents you have? Is it clean enough? Or what can you do with what you currently have? So data is definitely a key constituent. And if executed well, personalization will definitely help you guys get a consistent brand experience for your customer, help them feel more valued, definitely increases loyalty, and also should show up in your revenue numbers. Great, Mark, what would you add to that? I think the most important thing is to be prepared to invest time in the project. And when I'm saying invest time, you need to be able to map out the customer journey. Um, and by mapping out the customer journey, you, can, you need to look at things not just about how do people buy products, it's also how easy is it for, for them to return products, what experience are your potential customers getting from competitors' websites. And from that, once this is all mapped out, and you don't need data to map this out, once it's all mapped out, then you need to look to the analytics, and you need to either ask an analyst, if you have access to a, an analyst, 
Um, you need to create some hypotheses from the customer journey, and you need to find the data to back up your hypothesis, to work out what other things are worth testing for personalization. So really, to summarize what I just said, um, you need the qualitative analysis of mapping out the customer journey, and then you need the data to back up what you're thinking of testing before you even embark on looking on what you're going to do personalization on. Yeah, I'd just say, um, probably just to be a bit realistic about what you're trying to achieve, there's a lot you can do with personalization. And uh, sometimes when we're speaking with retailers, they're trying to do too much too soon. So um, sort of having modest goals to start with, but also um, having resources available. So understanding how much of your own in-house resource you can dedicate to personalization is pretty critical, because that, that influences the type of choices you make afterwards. So, so just, just be realistic. I think that makes sense. So data, mapping out the customer journey, keeping resources in mind. I think, Mark, you brought up an interesting point of, of mapping out the customer journey. And going back to that same survey from Adobe, 60% of online users has, had indicated that they wanted to be aware or know about why they were getting presented a, a certain offer, or how, why, you know, what is happening here. So I think clearly, you know, Consumers want to know and they want to participate in the process. So what can what can merchants do to further involve customers in defining a personalization strategy? Osbert? Um, well, there's a couple of answers to that. I think, firstly, don't be shy about it. A lot of retailers are concerned that they're doing all of this stuff and uh, it's going to freak the customers out and it, it won't. Um, so firstly, be upfront. So especially if you're following sort of spam compliance guidelines and things like that when we, in regards to personalized emails, you need to let them know that the information you're gathering can be used for marketing purposes, et cetera. Um, and then there's a couple of approaches. There's a sort of passive approach where um, you're monitoring what they're doing. So you can pick up information from their behavior on the site, such as their gender, uh, brand preferences, price sensitivity, uh, geolocation. All of those kinds of things can be done sort of passively and then proactively, uh, which a, a lot of retailers don't do, they should be doing things like using feedback forms. So getting feedback from the consumers and in that feedback form, you can start to do things like ask them for their date of birth, for example, that can be used to influence how you personalize the site. Um, do they have specific brand preferences or specific categories within your site that they're interested in? And using all of that information, you're engaging them in the process and then using that to make sure they see things that are relevant to the choices they're making. So I, I agree with what, a lot of what you just said. Um, I suppose the only thing I'd kind of say about that is I actually think people expect it nowadays. Most people expect a brand they interact with to offer them personalized recommendations. And I think just so long as you're clear about what you're doing and you give them the opportunity to opt in and out on the account page and you just manage it well, it's, there's not as much to worry about as some people might like to portray, I suppose. I oh, definitely agree with Osric uh, and Mark. Uh, be upfront with the customer. Let them know that you are providing or you intend to provide a personalized e-commerce experience for them. Another approach uh, you could take is uh, progressive uh, profiling. So instead of uh, getting all the information in one go, just take it step by step, right? So let's say for starters, if they just visit your site uh, for a sign up, I understand that you know merchants definitely want to get a lot of data from uh, customers. Instead of trying to get everything in one go, just get the first name and last name and an email address. So let's say you know when you sign on to a site, you understand that the customer understands that it needs to be provided to kind of progress and see some special pricing on the site. And then when they are actually ready to make a purchase, then you ask for the shipping address and mailing address. No problem sharing that and you get their location that way. So the customer knows at that point in time that, okay, I need to provide this in order for me to get the product, uh, right? And let's say, you know, if you're on a B2B industry or a similar industries, you can let them know, you know, what kind of industry are you in? Maybe we will send you personalized content. Customers definitely opt in uh, on that as well. You know, I can just share a couple of my personal examples. Let's take uh, Facebook, for example. You know, I wasn't too keen on sharing my birthday with Facebook. But then once I started doing that, people started wishing me on my birthday. It definitely feels good and feels more valued. Right? So I'm happy to share that there. 
or another example, right? I mean, I love Starbucks and I especially love it in August. That's when my birthday is because they give me a free coffee. So I've shared my birthday with them. So yeah, definitely progressive profiling. So just take it one step at a time and let the customer know that you're doing this. So it sounds like customers are more willing to participate and provide information. They know that they're actually going to get something of value out of it. Absolutely. Interesting. So I think, you know, kind of transitioning to where do we get started, right? I think uh, there was a Forrester survey that came out that said the majority of retailers have at least some sort of basic personalization in place, but not everybody does. So where do you, if you don't have basic personalization in, in place, where do you start? What, what are some of the, the quick wins? Mark? So where I would start is I, I, I don't know how many people caught Bob's analytics power hour or whatever it was called but the presentation yesterday afternoon where he went through all the data he'd collected from all the Magento sites in the states but there was a really important metric there for me and, th and it was the one where it showed um, if you can get people to buy more than once from your site um, the customer lifetime value shot up to 300 percent um, and for me, that really resonated, and it made me think, well, well that's the obvious place to start. So how, how would I do that? What's the example? So if you're not doing any personalization yet, the easiest kind of form, and usually the cheapest and the easiest one to set, set up is email personalization. So if you take Bob's example of someone who's just bought one thing from you, they're a new customer. If you can send them some targeted emails with personalized reg recommendations just for a month or two and just test some of those and see if you can turn that one person around and get them into buying at least twice from you, according to the stats and the data that he showed yesterday, that's going to have the most value out of anything. So for me, there's two reasons why you do it. It's the easiest one to set up, and it's the one that's got the data behind it to show that you're going to get the best bang for your buck. Osric, what would you add? Uh, yeah, definitely car abandonment's important. Um, another stat is that, you know, typically between 60 and 80 percent of the traffic to your site are first-time visitors. So there's a lot to be done in trying to target that segment of, of visitor. Um, in the case of Kitchenware Direct, one of our customers, they uh, opened up shipping in New Zealand. So they, they just set up a simple rule where if anyone arrived at the site from New Zealand, they would show a free shipping banner to New Zealand. And it's very logical, but they struggled to do that previously. Uh, and they saw a 400 percent increase in conversions just by showing that banner to New Zealand specific customers. So using that kind of technique, or even as we're approaching Christmas now, if you start to show um, geolocated banners for people coming from different areas, so if you're coming from a particular state, order by this date to get it before Christmas, whereas if you're coming from a different country, order by this date to get it before Christmas. Those are very simple things you can do uh, for first time visitors that will get you a lot of traction. And Karthik, where do some of your customers start? No, definitely. Actually, I want to ask a question to the audience. Yeah. So how many of you in the audience have subscribed to your competitor's newsletter? OK, that's a good number. So if you have not already subscribed to your competitor's newsletter, I highly encourage you to do that. I think that's a great place to start. So you understand that, OK, you don't really have any personalization strategy in place. You understand, OK, what exactly they are doing and how are they tailoring the content for you. And Mark, you mentioned about email personalization as well. I think you know that's uh, definitely a good strategy. And having the right subject line in the email definitely increases the open rate by at least 20%. You know, that's another thing. You know, and again, you know, another simple thing you could do is coupons. It's not that difficult to have a coupon strategy in place. Yeah. Great. So it sounds like we've got some good basic tips here: targeted emails, product recommendations, abandoned cart. Karthik, sticking on sticking with the, with you here, what are some approaches or tools that you can then build on? How do we how do we take that to the next level? No, definitely right. Recommendations. Uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, people in the audience here are aware of recommendations. People who bought this also bought why, and also recommendations based on user reviews. I think that's another uh, good approach uh, people could take uh, as an end user, right? So you're more inclined to trust what another user is saying as opposed to what the brand is saying about themselves. So recommendations based on user reviews and maybe even uh, behavior-based uh, uh, recommendations. Let's say you, know, you just have two items in stock and then just say that. You, know, you just have two items in stock and this is going to sell soon. But then 
it has to be personalized. It has to be personalized, right? You definitely have to have two items only. Let's say you know you and me sitting next to each other. You buy an item, and again it says two items in stock. Then you lose the trust, right? right? So I think yeah, these are some approaches. Yeah. Nice incorporating inventory I like that, Mark. So for me, I'll, I'll focus on the approaches rather than the tools. And what what I like to do with our clients is is I like to categorize the type of personalization. And there's there's three categories we like to look at. Um, so the first one is local personalization. So an example of that will be we have we have customers who are targeting the United States as well as Australia. And obviously because the seasons are different there, we need to personalize the content we're showing on the homepage. We need to show different prices, different shipping rules. Lots of things that are obvious, but actually um, not the first thing people think about when they think about personalization. They think of product recommendations rather than what we call local personalization. So that's one category. Um, the next one is um, personalization based on traffic. So we do a lot of um, paid advertising as well for our clients. And one of the problems we had in the past is you might do a banner or a promo, be it for a abandoned card or whatever. And on the banner, you've got your promo with a discount code or whatever. And it's, it's always been a bit of a challenge with Magento out of the box when people click on these banners to make sure that the promo codes are automatically added to the cart. You know, Because when people click on the banner, they're not making a note of these promo codes. So we'll personalized based on traffic source as well. And then the final category we like to look at is personalization based on action or in real time. And none of these are actually any different to what you just described. Um, but an example of personalization in real time is perhaps you know, they're $10 away from spending the right amount to get free shipping and just having a pop-up to just encourage them to spend that extra $10 with that magic word of free we find has really good results. But the main reason we categorize them is, is we find it much easier for reporting later to our clients. Because when you have these categories, it's easier to measure the effectiveness of personalization if you categorize it in these ways. So we find that's worked for our clients. I'm not sure if it will work for anyone else and if it's what you guys do. But that's what we do at Acid Green. Yeah, just um, one thing I'd say as far as evolving personalization, if you look at things like card abandonment, especially in Australia, there's a lot of mobile usage. So we recently ran a, a report, it's about a year and a half ago, and we surveyed or we basically collected data from 100,000 uh, different transactions that we were seeing. And we analyzed that data and what we found was 40% um, of conversions that were done on a smartphone started somewhere else. And on a tablet, it was 22% uh, of conversions started somewhere else. And the reason why that's important is because uh, if you're not tracking that kind of cross-device activity, what ends up happening is someone starts a, a shopping experience on a, on a PC at home or at work, and then they get on a bus and train, and then they're looking on their mobile device, and that data's lost, and the, the, the session data's not persisted. So all of a sudden, they have to kind of start over, and that's basically money falling through the gap. So if you're starting with card abandonment, as an example, that's a good way to, to progress how you advance your techniques around that area, just looking at mobile usage. Yeah, another thing I just want to add there is A-B testing. Uh, that's another uh, good thing, you know, uh, you could always try. Understand the amount of traffic you need to do, have to A-B test and try different things. You know, some things will work for some retailers and some will work for other folks, you know. So you just have to understand your customer, understand the customer behavior, understand, you know, their page purchase history. So, you know, we talked about coupons a little bit, right? So, you know, you're not going to send the same kind of coupons to everybody. This is basic coupons based on loyalty, you know, I'm buying from you a lot of times, it's okay to kind of throw in a coupon. Or if it's a first time visitor, you're already spending money on a PPC campaign, getting to your site, then uh, throw a 5% discount there, you know, it just depends on the retailer, you know. Interesting. So Karthik, you brought up A-B testing, right? That's certainly one way to go about it. There's lots of different tools out there, right? I think we've all been to conferences, every vendor likes to talk about their personalization capabilities. Magento certainly has native capabilities. There's a plethora of other tools out there that can be incorporated in. How does somebody sift through the, the, the sea of capabilities out there and determine the tools that are, that are best for them? Mark? So with us, it depends on the client and the life cycle of that website. So we find that some of the startups 
prefer to go to one of these models of, with a tool where they take a commission based on any sale generated from, um, from personalization. And then we find with other clients who might have a mature platform, that model doesn't really work for them and they prefer to pay a fixed price for the service. So it's quite a difficult question to answer, but yeah, the best answer I can give is that how we do it with our clients is it depends on the business model and revenue they, they're generating at that point in time. Oswald? Yeah, I think if you're trying to look at all the vendors, it is pretty tricky. Um, I definitely think the the business model is important. So some vendors do charge percentage, some some charge a flat fee. That's going to be crucial. Um, another aspect to look at is the ease of setup. Um, so how easy is it to actually get this stuff up and running? Uh, and then a third factor I'd say is is also understanding how core is personalization to your business, and then using that information to determine does this particular vendor have the necessary experience to, to help me out. So if, if, for example, you don't have much resources, um, so you need the vendor to help you, and they don't offer a managed service, that's probably not going to be a good choice for you. So just understanding those aspects as well can sort of separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. That makes sense, Karth. No, definitely, I would echo that. And also understanding the resources you need, like Osric mentioned, right? So what resources you have in-house and what resources you're going to get from the vendor. That's an important consideration. Definitely price is a very important consideration as well. And the return on investment, you know, how much are you going to invest and uh, the return on investment. And whatever vendor you end up choosing, definitely keep monitoring uh, it. I think uh, that is uh, very important as well. Yeah. Certainly. So this, this is an easy step, right? That's why there's, there's lots of tools, lots of experts out there. There was a Gartner study that was released that said, there are that 10% of the the tier one retailers are doing personalization, but they don't necessarily think that they're doing it effectively. So for those that find themselves in that boat, I guess a two part question, Osric, we'll, we'll start with you. Where do you find that they typically stumble and how do you course correct? Uh, where they typically stumble is is going back to what I said before, they, they, they've probably uh, set their expectations too high. Um, so they, they expect more than what they're able to get, at least to start with. Um, and definitely resources is a big factor. Um, I've, I've worked in lots of different software vendors selling different things, and it doesn't matter what you spend your money on. If you don't commit resources to using it, it's just not going to work. It doesn't matter how good the software is. So that's a big area where people stumble. Uh, also, back to the previous question, some people make choices based on the corporate standard, and it's actually not what they need. So, you know, Trying to deal with that internally can be political, but it's important. Uh, and then how do you course correct? Is, um, that's, a, that's a tricky one, but I, I would definitely say just go back to basics um, and try and just go for small wins. So a lot of the time when we start up with uh, retailers that are using our solution, um, they've got 20 things they want to do, and we literally just pick two or three. And we say, let's just focus on those. Let's get the trust. Let's get the, the whole organization understanding the benefits. And then after that, we can start to sort of ramp up from there. So don't overcomplicate it and don't be afraid to go back to the basics. Karthik? No, definitely not setting uh, clear goals and not really measuring uh, the outcome. Another uh, thing, uh, you know, I've always seen is, you know, some retailers, they try to personalize for themselves instead of personalizing it for the customer. What I mean here, right? So for instance, let's say, you know, you have a product in stock and you want to get rid of that inventory. So you send it to a customer and uh, you put it up on the homepage. You know, it's good, you know, in a way it's a good strategy because, you know, you're getting rid of your inventory. But another way, you know, if that's something I'm not interested in, then you're not really personalizing that experience for me, but you're saying that you're personalizing, right? So definitely personalize for your uh, customer. You know, I think uh, that's uh, very important. Another uh, thing, you know, what can you do to overcome it? Something, you know, you could do is micro conversions. So instead of trying to get the entire sale in one go in his first visit, take it one step at a time. Right, so let's say you know you have a great personalized experience. You get the customer to your site, do a small conversion, get his trust, and then build on it. So eventually, you know, you get a larger sale value over a period of time. So nurture the customer. And my my take on it would be the stumbling block is usually um, the the end user or the per person who owns the website. Um, 
expects too much from it and doesn't give it enough time themselves. They don't invest, invest enough time to configure it with the people who run the tools. Um, and it's the same with any software. The software is only as good as the person who configures it. Um, so the stumbling block is usually they don't have enough confidence in themselves that they understand their customers and what their customers want, and they just leave it to an algorithm or a data feed. And if they just worked a bit closer with the vendors, they'd get a better result, um, which kind of answers the second part of the question. Um, I'd only add on that is to have more tags to measure more points, which is what you're talking about with the micro conversions. So we've talked a lot about different strategies, tools, approaches. To somebody who in the audience might be saying, you know what, this sounds complicated, this sounds expensive, talk a little bit about the, the cost or resource implications that, that people should be considering when they, when they start doing personalization or as they're evolving. Doesn't well, just a quick question. Yeah. How many people in the audience are actually doing personalization today? Okay, so there's only a handful. I, I would say the cost implications of not doing personalization are, are pretty profound. Um, and we, we've got a ton of data on our website, which I won't bore you with now, but we've got infographics that prove the point. We're using personalized emails, using product recommendations on the site does generate a significant uplift, and it's not difficult to do. Um, so I would say the cost of not doing things are, are literally your business can, can fold. And if we look at... Um, some of the biggest retailers in Australia that have gone bust, a, a lot of that has been because they've had their lunch eaten by other people who are just getting on and trying different things. So um, don't be afraid to try. Start small, start simple, manage your costs, manage your expectations, and, and just start. That would be what I'd suggest. So you're saying the, the cost of not doing it could be more expensive than, than doing it. So if, you, if, say for somebody who is going to do it, what, what should they be considering? It's not a question of if you're going to do it or if you're not going to do it, right? So when are you going to start? So you'll definitely have a good return on investment. Take baby steps, right? So and take baby steps. And once you see the dollars coming, you're definitely more glad and you'll be glad to invest more. So just go do it. And for me, the, the cost is your time. And most of the people who are running successful websites don't, don't have the time. And unless you're prepared to invest it, I wouldn't actually begin with it. I'd wait till you've got some time to invest in it. But more importantly than that, it's the ability to measure and track goals, which you've talked about, and actually um, formalize what success looks like, what are the critical success factors before you implement it, and be really, really um, proactive in asking questions of the vendors. Keep on top of them when you do implement it, keep asking them questions because you're going to have better insights than they do. Not because they're not clever people, but you'll always understand your customers better than they do. Um, and I think that's the best thing. You've got to be able to measure it and you've got to give it time and then you will get the rewards. But unless you're prepared to do that, I would probably hold off for a bit until you're ready to make that investment. Yeah, and one more thing I want to add is in terms of uh, cost, you know, you can always use the Magento score capabilities instead of even going to another tool just to begin with. Let's say if you're not doing personalization today, you can just get started with what's already there in Magento, maybe pull up some reports, start sending some emails, maybe using your uh, Gmail or uh, your company email and see if that's actually working. And once you see that working, then, you know, you can get on to maybe an email tool like uh, MailChimp or another tool out there. And then, you know, you can take it a step further. You know, so take one step at a time. Good advice. So we have a, about a minute or so left. Want to give you guys the opportunity to ask questions of the panelists. Anybody have a question out there? We've answered all the questions. Uh, so we, we quote on our website, uh, the, the question was, what kind of sales increase can you expect from product recommendations, email, um, personalized emails? Personalized emails and, and card abandonment type stuff, um, we say anything from 10 to 30% increase on conversion. Uh, you'll see on our website that it's much higher than that. Uh, product recommendations can be 40% upwards uh, in terms of increase on conversions from what you're currently at. Anybody else? All right, well, if you have any other questions, we are here.
throughout the, the rest of the day, you can feel free to track us down either real quickly after the session or uh, later on. Want to thank you guys all for attending. Let's have it. Let's hear it for our panelists here. Thank you guys. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of, your, of the uh, day. Thank you. <laughs>